Hello YouTube! I am Pinstar and this is Pinstar Plays Dwarf Fortress. Or actually more of a Pinstar Teaches Dwarf Fortress. So this game has been a, a thing that I've been playing for ages. If you see the copyright 2002 to 2022, that's not a joke. That is that, that is how long this game has been in development by Tarn Adams. It is a it is self-described his life work and he's continuing to update it, uh, you know, into the future. This is a humongously uh, complex base building game, uh, arguably the father of many other base building games like RimWorld. This one, it, it it can be a little bit much to get into, so today we're going to start on our on my uh, teaching Let's Play series, where we dive headfirst in and I uh, give you an idea of how to get your first fort set up and get some of the basics going and see where it goes from there. Now normally you would create a new world, I've already done that to save us some time, so we have created the 19th hole. Alright, we are here. Now, we are not going to be doing the tutorial, though I would recommend doing the tutorial, if, at least for your first, you know, tutorial-ish fork, but I will be your tutorial today. Now, when looking for a suitable embark spot, I would certainly avoid the extremes, the, you know, your ice sheets, your deserts, you know, generally those type of things, as well as you want to avoid evil areas. The land here, sort of like a Dungeons and Dragons alignment, there's a land, the land itself can be good, neutral, or evil. And neutral and good are fine, but evil brings its own challenges meant for, you know, extreme and advanced force. So do not, do not embark in an evil biome for your first fort. It, it will not be pretty. If you really want the easiest, you probably want to find, and don't be shy about using find embark location. You want to turn, you want to say, no to heavy aquifers. They can be really challenging to get through. But don't be afraid of light aquifers. We, if You can punch through a light aquifer with your first fort, no problem. And I'll show you how. The other thing you want to probably do, if you want your very first one, go for a calm savagery. That will minimize the, the impact of, of random animals that wander onto the map. They'll generally be harmless, they'll leave you alone generally, and they won't pose as much of a problem. Other than that, you probably want to look for things with, for trees, you know, forested, woodlands, something with some sort of trees in there. And then for other vegetation, you know, moderate to, as long as there's some form of other vegetation, that gives you options for the surface. This is not, certainly not my first fort. But um, I, I have a personal preference for one type of land. And it's going to go a little bit against that. It's actually the surroundings joyous wilds. Joyous wilds are what you get when you have a good aligned biome that is also high in savagery. So basically out in the, in the deep wilderness, but it's still good. You get some very interesting creatures wandering in. And yes, it is certainly going to be a bit harder than a calm or serene biome, but I, I you know, I like it. I like it a lot. So we're going to be going with one of those. The other thing you want to pick is your origin civilization. The one thing you want to be careful of is, depending on how much history you've uh, simulated, some of your civilizations may be dead or dying, like the helpful walls. Their walls were certainly not helpful to them because they have no sites left and only four people left. Uh, the dead paddles, no sites left, only 28 people. Not good. So you want to find one ideally close to where you are embarking to, but as long as they have a non-zero number of sites and a non-zero number of population, it's fine. It does not have to literally be the largest or most populous of civilizations, as long as you got something. So we're going to go with the Bolt of Turquoise because they're somewhat close to our uh, desired location. I mean, they're a little bit of a trek away, but closer than the others that aren't dead. So now we click on here, and yeah, the other thing you want to look for is what, what do you have in there? So here we've got shallow sand, deep soil, a light aquifer, which like I said, is not something that's going to be a problem. And then a whole bunch of metals, which is always good. The more the merrier. 
And a flex stone layer basically means we have the wherewithal that when combined with iron, we can make steel. So we've got a pretty, pretty well set thing here. Temperature is warm, which is fine. Trees is woodland, which is fine. Other vegetation is moderate, which is fine. Temperate shrubland is our, is our biome. That's important to some surface level plants because certain plants will only grow in certain biomes. So yeah, let's embark and I now because we're going we have a uh, light aquifer we don't need to include the stream but I'm going to include it anyway just to give us some options but I'll include it in like the the corner here so it's not front and center yeah it's going to give us a little warning about the aquifer that's fine prepare carefully okay the first uh first thing that we're going to do here is we're going to um, map out and set the skills of our dwarves now this this particular gambit is the way i'm embarking this is not necessarily how you have to embark but this is how i like to do it if you've seen some of my quick tip videos before you see you'll see some of these tips in action here our first thing is we want to find our our weapon and armor smith and we actually want to go into the personalities of our different dwarves to find who would be the best naturally skilled one of them. What we're looking for is kinesthetic sense, spatial sense, and creativity. We want to find somebody that has the greatest of any of those three kinesthetic being the most important of the three. And yeah, don't just look at the at the uh, overview tab, actually go into the personality and look at the highlighted ones here. So that's not so good. Good kinesthetic, good spatial. That's more like it. Let's see what this last dwarf's like. That's spatial sense. All right, not too bad, not too bad. All right, so this is probably our best, uh, one of our best people. Who, who, there was one other one that we could get. Not the focus and intellect. So we have two people. I, I know these two are, are negatives on the, on the kinesthetic and, and creativity, but the fact that they have a great feel, that's actually a, a step up from a good feel here. So I think we're gonna make this our metal worker and then this our other crafter. So we're gonna go armor smith and weapon smith for this person. And then here for this other person, we're gonna go carpenter and stone carver. This is basically gonna be our furniture maker for the most part. They, they'll, they'll be doing other things as well, but they, they will be making the beds and tables and chairs and doors and all the other stuff that makes our, our dwarves living quarters all the better. Now we need to find a leader. Uh, who is going to be our both our, our negotiator, but also our forts leader. But there's one other skill that I, I hadn't mentioned in previous ones that I kind of have adapted to. So we want someone with social skills, but if we have memory, good spatial sense and good empathy. Memory, language, empathy, focus, intellect, iron will, focus, intellect. Yeah, I think this... Uh, Amazing memory, good sense of empathy, and yeah, that should be fine for our leader. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna give them a, a smattering of skills here. We're gonna go for a couple of, of negotiator skills. We're gonna do a judge of intent, praiser, and an organizer. Now on the flip side, we're gonna give them a completely unrelated set of sk skills, and that is herbalist. When you're embarking on a uh, place that has uh, surface level plants, embarking with an herbalist is actually really good. That's a great way to get some materials from the native, latest native biome that you don't have to pay for in terms of uh, embarking with. And it also helps with organization and managing your stacks. More on that in a little bit. Now, the last four is gonna be our mmm squad. And as mentioned in my mmm video, watch that for more details as to the why, we are going to give them all shield user. Shield user, shield user, and shield user for the combat side of things. Now on the crucial side of things, there's gonna be one little deviation I did from my video. We're gonna give them four points of stone cutter. But then we're going to give them a single point of something else. And that something else is going to be varied. The reason why, if they enter into a strange mood, it's going to pick their highest level moodable skill. Now, stone cutter is not a moodable skill. Shield user is not a moodable skill. But things like, oh, I don't know, 
bower. So for example, if this dwarf gets picked for being a bower, uh, gets picked for a strange mood, they'll actually create a legendary bow. Um, even though that, that they're only at a skill level one, that will, that will sort of shift their strange mood into something very useful and valuable. So we're gonna do that for the others here. We're gonna do four levels of stone cutter and let's say gem cutter. Four levels of stone cutter, gem setter. Four levels of stone cutter and oh, let's say leather worker. There we go. And that way those strange moods can trigger. In fact, actually let's apply the same idea to here. Instead of a level four herbalist, actually no, we, want the, we do want max level herbalist. So we're gonna tone back um, one of our levels of negotiator and we're going to, we're going to sort of earmark them for a, uh, a bone carver. That's a good, that's a good mutable skill to have. All right. So that's our dwarves. I'll rename them when we get on site. There's a bug where you can't really properly rename them on the embark screen, but I, uh, we'll be giving them the names to my name in game patrons. If you want your name in this uh, series, check out my Patreon page down in the description below. Now for the items. We are going to get rid of a bunch of these things that we don't want. The prefabricated stuff like these axes, no. We're going to make them on site. Bags we will make on site thread, the ropes. I am going to bring one quiver just because it helps us start getting into hunting more easily if we want it. But yeah, those, get rid of those, get rid of those. We do not need to pay 50 for a wheelbarrow and a stepladder. We make those on site, Karns farmed it. And when it comes to drinks, we're going to be making our own drinks. The wine and cheese, if you haven't seen it, check out my wine and cheese quick tip video. And that will explain how we will be taking care of our alcohol needs, as well as our early farming needs, um, getting the most out of our embark points. So let's go down the list here first. So the, if we're going to be doing the wine and cheese gambit, let's start with the, uh, the cheese part of it. Uh, now we don't embark with cheese themselves. We are going to extracts and we search for milk extracts. And we want five units of each of these. So those we will turn into cheese. And the reason why we're getting five of each is that we can, uh, each conversion can do a stack of five milk into a stack of five cheese. And then that leaves behind a free barrel for us, which is fantastic. And that's where we get into the wine side of the equation. So now we want to bring some stuff that we can turn into wine. Um, now the plump helmets, uh, they're four a piece. That's way too expensive. I am going to bring five of them just so that we can get a little plump helmet wine for those dwarves that like that. But we can do better. Garden vegetables. So we want to take a look at all of these things that have, um, that might be useful in brewing. And also you want to um, be mindful of your biome and your temperature uh, when choosing these things. Now, I, in my originally che original cheese and wine, I said raspberries are the go-to because they can pretty much grow anywhere. And that is, that is correct. But if possible, you might want to bring a, a fiver of other brewable things just to, um, just to give you some variety because dwarves do like a variety. So I'm going to bring five raspberry or five strawberries um, basically five of all of these others. Oh yeah, there's a little bug where it sometimes doesn't let you, uh, unless you search for it specifically. So I'm gonna, raspberries are gonna be the lion's share of what we bring, 25 of them. But blackberries we want five of. And let's see what's other, uh, what other goodies we want here on the garden vegetables. Cranberries can be, uh, can be brewed. Uh, purple amaranth can be brewed. And again, we're just going for blocks of five here so that we can get some variety in the booze. All right, one, um, one other tip that I have for you um, when it comes to bringing extra food and getting free barrels out of the deal is uh, you can get this with meat and fish. Um, by bringing one-offs of meat and fish, you can get a, basically a separate free barrel for them. The, one, the trick to that is bringing basically one unit of each animal. So if you like prepared Wolverine lung and prepared Wolverine heart will come in the same barrel. But if you just get one of those, you'll get an extra barrel for all the Wolverine parts here. And it really doesn't matter what part you get. So just go for each individual animal. Now, some of the animals will cost more than two points. Um, just so just be mindful of that. 
Uh, so yak, so yeah, cougars and whatnot. I wouldn't bother with the four or the six pointers. Worm, honeybee brain, kind of weird spider monkey intestines. Bumblebee, dragonflies, ants, beetle, peafowl, snails. Again, these are just like, they give you little bits and pieces of meat, but also lots of free barrels. Um, and that helps us preserve our, our wood supply on the surface. Because the last thing we want to do is worry about having to chop down a whole bunch of trees, because that causes their own um, sets of problems. Of course, you don't have to go too nuts with this. There is a limit to the usefulness of all of these. Now then, the next big expense that we want to do here is metal bars. Now in my mmm squad, I uh, expounded the, the virtue of bismuth, specifically bismuth bronze, but we're not going to embark with bismuth, bismuth bronze itself. We're going to make our own bismuth bronze. So I'm going to, I'm going to actually go completely nuts with bismuth here. I'm going to go 10 bismuth bars. Uh, where's our 10? 10 tin bars. And then you need um, a ratio of, of 1 to 1 to 2, with the 2 being copper, so 20 copper bars. Now, on top of the 20 copper bars, we go for 5 more copper bars on top of it, uh, because we're going to be making some things directly out of copper. So that's going to give us a lot of metal. Now, one other tip I have for you is um, when it comes to fuel, Check to see if you have bituminous coal, or just type in or search for coal, and go to the stone, and we do. So bituminous coal will turn into coke at a very, very good ratio. So since we have this, this is the best way to have fuel early on. So we're gonna embark with, say, eh, 10 of this. This will make a whole bunch of fuel for our early game operations. That way we don't have to start burning wood for charcoal. The one thing you do want to get, though, is one unit of refined fuel, so coke or charcoal, either way, because you need a little fuel to make more fuel. So one unit of coke will let you break these luminous coal rocks further down. Now, another thing you're going to want to embark with is a uh, just some stones, um, because you need to have a material to make your initial workshops out of. Since you're not going to, since we're not going to be immediately breaking into the earth, just embarking with some cheap stones will uh, give us something to do. I usually go for granite. Uh, it gives us some. Um, gives us a material that can be fireproof, which is needed for some workshops. So 10 granite for our various things here. All right, and last but not least, we have 528 points. We go to animals. Now, as in my animals video, we are going to be embarking with a certain set of things. We want uh, two dogs, one male, one female, untrained because they're cheaper and we can train them on site. Uh, one cat. Uh, it doesn't really matter, male or female, but I do not want a breeding pair of them because that can cause that can, they they can breed out of control uh, and cause some problems. On that note, now do we have turkeys? Does this embark? Yes, we do. Okay, so we are going to want a breeding pair of turkeys, a gobbler and a hen, and because it is useful to have um, wool available. Um, I'm going to go for llamas. I, I happen to like llamas. I'm not going to go too nuts with wool, um, but I am going to get a breeding pair of llamas, both of, the, of which are shearable. The rest of our points are going to go into goats. So one billy goat and the rest into nanny goats. And that gives us nine nanny goats. Could probably pull back and get to an even 10 nanny goats, because I want some more nanny goats. Let's pull back on some of our other stuff here. Oh yeah, um, our seeds for our underground plants, we do want to update these, because these were just the originals. I'm not a big fan of rock nuts, not a big fan of sweet pods, not a big fan of cave wheat. We can always trade for them later. But plump helmets, pigtails, dimple cups, useful. Yeah, let's tone down our bismuth purchasings here. 9, 9, and 23. Because we do want to up our, our um, spawn count for these. I'd say up to like 15. 
And then we can go back and get more nanny goats. Well, one more nanny goat. And then for 10 points, we can just get a few more things. Let's get a few more things of fish. Again, one of each species to get ourselves extra free barrels. There we go. That's better. Okay, now, of course you all know what, uh, what I'm going to be naming this fort. Um, and they even have a search bar for it. So, Ficklewood. Huh. No Ficklewood, huh? No Ficklewood, huh? Well, you know the rules. You know what happens when a game prevents me from using Ficklewood as, uh, as my thing. It is time to have a hilariously inappropriate name instead. I present you our grand settlement in the noble dwarf tongue. Bidoskadot. Circumamir Belvez. Or, translated into English, Act Surprise, the Random Pregnancy of Goats. Yes, that's actually our settlement's name, and it is glorious. And you cannot convince me otherwise. And of course, we need to give a name to our group itself, uh, our, our little band of seven dwarves that, we're, that is splintering out on its own. The Cheese Mongrels. I think a, a, a fitting name for it, given our, uh, our initial activity and interest and also uh, um, abundant uh, supply of, of nanny coats. Uh, group symbol. Yeah, let's have fun with this one. Our group symbol. It is an image of a dwarf and ten nanny goats. The ten nanny goats are laboring. The dwarf looks confused. Right then. I think we are ready to embark. So, in our next episode, we will actually take a uh, 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 hit the ground running and get our fortress going. Um, get our stuff set up, get all of our, our um, things prepared and, and created uh, so that we can get our fortress up and running quickly. I hope you guys found this one useful. If you did, go ahead and hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and leave me a comment. Good, bad, or indifferent. Your feedback's always welcome. So until next time, this has been Pinstar, signing out. See ya!